given us life and a way of living, strength and the opportunity to succeed. This film is a tribute to nature, but it is a tribute to man too. It is the story of the valley where we live. We made this film because we wanted to show our valley to the world. We wanted to show the vast potential of its rich rural areas and flourishing secondary industries. The pioneers planned and worked hard to open up the valley. Their foresight has helped us to achieve much, but there's still a lot to be done. The man on the tractor and the man in the factory both have parts to play. The future of this part of Australia depends on us. Nearly two centuries ago, Captain Cook went sailing to discover more of the world. What he did find halfway round the world from England was a new country, Australia. A great new landmass of three million square miles bigger than Europe. We are one small part of it. In New South Wales is the Hunter Valley. We lived in this valley. Our valley begins here at the birthplace of the Hunter River, which gives the valley life. It rises at Barrington Tops, the spur of the Great Dividing Range, a mountain plateau covered by snow for one third of the year. A circle of mountains cradles the birthplace of the hunter. This great stream is born in melting snow on Barrington Tops. First, just a trickle. Soon, a clear stream running through the undergrowth of the foothills. And from a stream, it grows to a broad river. Hunter travels 200 miles eastward to the sea, gathering five other rivers into itself on the way growing, broadening. The river is our greatest asset. We are careful not to waste it. Benborn Dam was built on the upper reaches to conserve water for irrigation, but it gave us something else as well. Australians take to the water by instinct and we're no exception in the Hunter Valley. When Glen Bourne turned part of our river into a big lake, we stopped envying the coastal dwellers their beaches. We're sitting pretty now, with all the facilities for water sport right at our doorstep. Glen Bourne can hold more than a quarter of a million acre feet of water. Wind in your hair, spray in your face. What more could anyone want? In the few years since we found this new use for our river, some of us have come to be pretty good on water skis. Here's someone who does just as well without them. If you're feeling energetic, this is fine. If you're not feeling quite so active, you can try this. The big storage area of the Glenbourne Lake has been stocked with young fish. They're thriving in the dam, and a fishing club has been formed by the anglers among us. Lately, a lot of people from outside have been coming to the valley for holidays. We welcome them. There's plenty for everybody. Birds, thousands of birds, ducks, pelicans, cranes, swans, all sorts of birds find sanctuary here. 
The waters of the dam have increased their food supply and here they're protected from destruction. There are about 10,000 square miles of the Hunter Valley. Much of it looks like this. It's good land and 90% of the valley area is used for primary production. It's a rich and prospering region, but it must progress. Our primary and secondary industries can still develop. We have to plan the conservation of our land, forests and water, particularly our water. All the industries of our valley need water. The tiller of the soil and the maker of steel both need an abundance of good water. So the river system is literally our life stream. The river links the valley's towns. Scone, center of the Upper Hunter, a rural town in a prosperous district. With Glenbourne Dam nearby, Scone is getting used to tourists. A little further north, Murrurundi, northern gateway to our valley, in the shadow of the picturesque Liverpool Range. The tourist who takes the trouble to really explore the fine country of the Upper Hunter is rewarded by coming across a strange phenomenon, the Burning Mountain. It's close to a little place called Wingen, and you could probably overlook it if you were in a hurry. The mountain really does burn. It contains seams of coal and shale which have been alight for thousands of years. All over the valley, you'll find symbols like this. The famous studs of the hunter produce horses which have won recognition all over the world. We know the valley is generous, and we're not taking it for granted. These crops were planted in experiments by the Department of Conservation to find ways of protecting our topsoil against erosion. These days, the farmer and the scientist work side by side. Contour ploughing, terracing, crop rotation, tree planting, they all help us conserve the soil. But the river is our chief concern. The Hunter Valley Trust coordinates all the work of protecting river banks and preventing siltation. Without this work, coupled with the job of flood mitigation, we could lose the valuable topsoil. We're helping nature in other ways too. This is the cattle breeding station at Aberdeen. The New South Wales Milk Board and the Department of Agriculture control it. Selective breeding has produced some really high class stock here. Their progeny are helping to raise the productivity of herds in the valley. The red and white of the herbivores is a common sight on the grazing lands of the valley. The valley has been a food producing area since 1813 when colonists began to grow vegetables around Maitland for the colony at Sydney. Today, stocks like these are patterned for the home market and for export. Australia's laughing bird, the kookaburra, and the sooty polled angus. This is Bell Tree's homestead, not far from Scone. It was the gracious home of one of the pioneer families of the valley. More than 100 years ago, the great Australian explorer William Charles Wentworth built this log cabin on Bell Tree's. Wentworth, one of the three men who found a way over the Blue Mountains and opened up inland New South Wales, built it to last. Today it's still in use as a community centre. More rugged, hilly parts of our valley are where you'll find the cattle. In fact, there are more than a quarter of a million beef cattle grazing in the valley on pastures watered by the hunter system. And that's just beef cattle. They're still coming to the dairy lands. Further west in the valley, you'll find this sort of thing going on. Not many people realize that our valley is a wool growing area too. Most people think of it only as a dairying region. But wool makes up one quarter of the rural production in the valley, 
second only to Derry. The fact that we produce wool, high quality wool at that, makes the Hunter Valley unique among coastal valleys in New South Wales. Merino rams like this one bred in the Merawa Catalyst District reflect the intensive breeding of carefully selected stock which has been going on since Captain MacArthur founded the Australian wool industry in 1794. The black soils of the wool growing areas of the valley produce a high class wool, mainly 64s to 70s. Usually it sells from a penny to sixpence a pound above the New South Wales average price. But then, we like to think that most things in this valley of ours are better than average, although we don't mind making improvements where we can. The soils in some parts of the valley are deficient in phosphate, sulphur and other chemicals. In the high rainfall areas, we lose calcium from the soil. And we found that the best way to correct these faults is by dropping fertilizers and top dressing from the air. This is a boon to pastures. But often, all that's needed to improve things is water irrigation water to augment the rainfall. We have up to 25 inches of rain a year in the Upper Hunter. With water conservation and irrigation, our stock can be short of pasture all year round. So the development of irrigation has helped us withstand the problem of drought a really big consideration in an area where dairying is the main primary industry. Let's move down the valley to Mucklebrook. They mine coal here, but it's dairying country too. Like most Hunter Valley towns, Mucklebrook is sharing in the tourist boom. Modern motels and hotels are becoming part of the scene. It's the junction of the main northern railway line with two other lines, and tourists branch out from here to other parts of the Upper Hunter. From the air, a patchwork of fields around Musselbrook. There are scores of farms here, and you'll find a lot of fodder crops. This man is mowing Lucerne. Let's go down for a closer look. Fodder conservation is good farming, an insurance against a bad season. It's widely practiced in our valley. The lucerne is mowed, baled and picked up automatically. This is how a modern man and his tractor go to mow a meadow. And this is how a modern dairy farmer sends his milk to the factory. Stainless steel tankers carry it in bulk. The story of dairy farming in the Hunter Valley is a story of continuing advancement. The collection of milk in bulk tankers is a big step forward. It's quicker and more efficient. The tanker is making its daily call to the dairy farm. The driver is a trained operator who can pick up more than 2,000 gallons of milk at a time in his tanker. It's a simple operation. The days when the dairy farmer had to cart milk cans to the road to meet the pickup truck are disappearing. Now a special hose is run from the truck to a refrigerated vat in the dairy. Loading begins. The driver checks the quantity with a dipstick and credits it to the farmer's account. What does all this mean to the farmer? Well, there are no more cans for him to fill, cart and clean. He needn't even be there when the milk is collected, so he's got more time for other jobs. And the milk is taken from the cow to the factory without being touched or exposed to contamination, and is kept at the right temperature all the time. Cans are still used for most milk collection, but bulk cartage is being more widely applied. This is the Hunter Valley Cooperative Dairy Company's branch factory at Frankston, one of many modern factories in our valley.
Another big thing, power generation. Electricity generated in the coal fields area of the Hunter Valley is distributed through the state grid system to all parts of New South Wales. It's expected we'll be generating 80% of the state's power within 10 years. Two vast seams of coal running from one end of the valley to the other make it an ideal site for power stations. Not far from here, in the Denman district, is another valley, the Widden. The Widden is an area of fertile country ringed by hills. A peaceful place. In the Widden is Barrimore, homestead of a stud farm where the bloodlines of many future racehorses are planned. Mares and their foals. They're on improved pastures in ideal condition. This is where quality counts. There are mares here with famous names who are yet to play their part in producing foals who could become famous on the turf. The leading sire has already stamped his fine lines on the progeny here. Isn't he a beauty? They soon grow to yearlings and so find their way to the annual sales in Sydney. The buyers are quick to recognise the spirited youngsters from the hunter and they bring top prices. The variety of our valley is endless. You come upon a sea of wheat in another district which is part of the hunter, the Golden Valley. Large areas are sown to wheat every year and the harvest is a good one. We move east again to Singleton. The main street, John Street, is a modern commercial centre. But there are reminders here of the past. Singleton looks forward to the future, even though the past has had setbacks. Several times the town has known our river's other temper in devastating floods yet they seem to have made little lasting difference. Singleton's parks and pleasant homes speak only of order and progress. This is historic Baruna homestead with its memories of the four in hand days. When you stand on its wide verandas with their elaborate timber frescoes, it seems you can still hear the echoes of carriage wheels. The Runa homestead looks out over some of the best farming lands in our valley, lands eagerly sought by the early settlers. The hunter flows on, seaward, twisting and turning. Soon it's joined by the Patterson, one of its main tributaries. Like the hunter, the Patterson rises at Barrington Top. But it flows further to the east through grazing land and dairy country to join the hunter just below Maitland. Maitland, where the valley's history began in a small timber getter's camp. One of the things a visitor remembers about Maitland is the long bridge, a bridge without a river on the northern approach to the city. The river used to run here, but it changed its course. You come to the main street, High Street. In 1850, Maitland was considered second only to Sydney in commercial importance. Today, Newcastle overshadows it, but Maitland still grows. Industries like the Bradford Cotton Mills help it prosper. This is true river country. Along the Bulwara Flats around Maitland, the deep alluvial soil is so rich that they don't erect dividing fences between the farms. That would be a waste of land. And as for the Lucen, it grows green and lush in the loamy soil. We make many thousands of tons of hay and silage in the valley every year. Lucen provides most of it. In 
In many ways, our valley is a sort of cameo, like a scale model of agricultural Australia. In this 10,000 square miles, we have a cross-section of all Australia's primary production. Perhaps we're rather like the beehive, always on the go, getting the best from our world. Apiaries dock the countryside along the Hunter. Our beekeepers not only keep us supplied, they produce honey for export too. Things really buzz at showtime. That's the big time of the year in the towns of the valley. All the shows have the same theme, but somehow they're all different. They declare a public holiday for the show, things take on a pretty festive air. But nobody forgets the real purpose of the show. It's a chance for the man on the land to put his produce and his stock on display. It's also a chance for a good yarn with a friend you mightn't have seen for weeks. Here's the grand parade. It's the big spectacle of the show. Whether the show itself lasts two days or three or five, the one day you can't miss is the day of the grand parade. The whole district is on display here. The horses groomed till they shine, step high and handsome. The cattle are fat and sleek. It's their first show, and they're a bit self-conscious about it all. It's not an easy job being judge at a show like this, and the prize is only part of the reward for the men who bred these beauties. Their satisfaction is in knowing that quality like this helps build the future of our valley. And here's something that's always popular, a man's work this. Razor sharp blades, keen eyes and powerful muscles send the chips flying. Wood chopping and the camp craft are things we learn from our fathers. In our valley, the men who handle cattle excel at this and the sturdy stock horses we breed here are a team with their riders, deftly turning the bullock over the course. And another type of horse, the sure-footed polo pony. Polo is popular in the valley, and many of our teams are known throughout Australia. You'll find horses doing many different jobs at shows in the Hunter. These are carefully trained show horses and set themselves eagerly to the jump. But on another part of the ground, you'll find other horses just as eagerly setting themselves to the task of getting rid of their riders. These horses have no manners at all, but we're proud of them and of the men who can master them. Not quite happy in unfamiliar surroundings, the champion ram puts up with the business of judging. And as you see the quality of the fleece and watch sheep like this on parade, you can't help feeling proud. You're not really surprised to find the Prime Minister awarding the prizes. After all, wool is the basis of our national economy. And in an average season, the valley's wool check is worth about five million pounds. Not bad for a so-called dairying area, is it? We, the people of the Hunter Valley, have a lot to be proud of. In the
the bustle of the show, it's a relief to stop for a drink of milk. And the very milk at this milk bar. Or some at this milk bar. The show brings the country to the town, and so it has a special value for Cessnock, a town founded not on primary production, but on coal. Cessnock is the hub of the coal fields of the Hunter Valley, standing on the rich Rita coal measure. There are about 50 mines on the coal field, producing almost half Australia's black coal. The coal reserve is estimated at 2,100 million tonnes. It's the greatest reserve of coal in the South Pacific. In 1961, coal earned 19 million tonnes for our valley. Our natural resources are guarded by the Hunter Valley Research Foundation. It's investigating rainfall, siltation, flood mitigation, land use, potential. From the lessons of the past, we are planning the future. We are planning for industries like our Hunter Valley Vineyard, because that's something else you'll find in our valley. Rows and rows of grapevines, neat, orderly, and productive. We have about 1,000 acres of the valley devoted to grape production. Not a huge area, but it's significant. In an average year, we produce well over 500 tonnes of wine grapes and about 100 tonnes of table grapes. They earn something like £121,000 a year. We owe our long-standing wine industry to vintners among the early settlers who recognised the possibilities of soil and climate and laid out the first vineyards at Colburn and Bellwood. Today, if you know wine, you know Hunter Valley wine. We don't claim to produce the most wine in Australia, but we do believe the quality is second to none. But let's leave business and go outdoors again, back to the source of our river, Barrington Top. Snowstorms are just about unknown in the valley, but we get them for two months of the year in the high mountain country, and the melting snow here in the catchment helps feed our rivers. But the reason we've brought you back here is to show you something that not many people know about our valley. You can ski several months of the year. Experienced skiers are enthusiastic about the snow fields here, and Barrington Top seems likely to become a popular winter holiday resort. this practically in sight of a semi-tropical rainforest, another of the valley's surprises. The valley's timber industry is relatively small but vigorous. Like most of our natural resources, timber is guarded carefully. Only trees selected by the Forestry Commission are touched by the timber getter's blade. Young trees are left to replace the timber fell. of the falling tree startles the forest. The timber in the valley has been used for the last 20 years or so for the production of hardboard at the Masonite factory at Raymond Terrace near Newcastle, an industry worth millions to the valley.
from these forests, the Patterson River flows southward to join the hunter at Maitland. And there's a story in the dense curtain of willows growing along both banks of the Patterson. Once river boats carried supplies in and produce out, their wash was damaging the river bank. So the settlers of the day planted willows. Today their long trailing fingers still protect the banks from water erosion. Many flowering trees add their splash of colour along the Patterson, the flowering plant, the silky oak, and Bougainvillea. And along the Patterson is one of the six main dairying areas of our valley, the patterson Gresford district. This is one of the most fertile regions of the Great Valley floor. Everything seems to grow just that little bit better here. The centre of the area is Dungog on the Williams River, another tributary of the Hunter. Tourists. Close to Dungog are many things to see. Barrington Tops, the wide sweep of the open valley, or Chichester Dam. Have a look at it. There are 5,000 million gallons of water here. The Hunter District Water Board draws on this dam, carrying water through 54 miles of pipeline to Newcastle and to other parts of the Lower Hunter. Poultry is big business in our valley, and the poultry farms are up to date too, with a high degree of mechanisation. Chickens, turkeys, geese, and a pig. Well, he's not poultry, but he's part of the picture. Probably water is our most precious possession. Without the river system, our valley would not be what it is. From the Williams River, a diversion channel carries water to augment the Chichester Dam and this unusual water supply scheme. The water is underground here in a natural reservoir in sand beds in the Tomago Basin. The sprays are used to purify the supply. Water for taps in towns like Raymond Terrace. Water to fill the Raymond Terrace baths. Water for the industries of the valley. Here, for instance, at Courtauld's, rayon yarn, tire cord and other synthetic fibres are being made. And the masonite factory, also at Raymond Terrace. It needs water for the manufacture of hardboards. Water for the citrus orchards. Raymond Terrace on the junction of the Williams and the Hunter owes its progress to both the farm and the factory. Now we've followed our river from its beginnings in the mountains. Now it's a noble stream moving more slowly as it nears the end of its journey. Now we meet boats. The river is a highway. The 60 milers, as they're called, carry coals from Newcastle. The snubby little fishing boats, the prawners, they too win a living from our river. Just west of Newcastle, Hexham, junction of the highways to the north coast and the northern inland. And here is the main factory of the Hunter Valley Cooperative Dairy Company, nerve centre of our valley's greatest primary industry. Every year, the Hunter Valley produces more than 40 million gallons of milk. 
Every year, more than 34 million gallons are delivered to the five factories operated by the Hunter Valley Cooperative Dairy Company. Milk. Milk to supply one home in every four in Sydney and Newcastle and most of the homes in our valley. Milk to be powdered for export to be made into butter, cheese and ice cream. This huge enterprise is a living example of the vitality of the dairying industry in the Hunter Valley. It began in 1903 when a few dairymen banded together to form a cooperative company. Today it is a business with an annual turnover of 7 million pounds and branch factories at Muddlebrook, Morpeth, Frankston and Patterson. This is cheese in the making. And in the giant churns, butter. Stainless steel churns are electronically controlled. They produce two and a half tons of butter at a time. Dairying earns more than one third of the rural income of the Hunter Valley. Anything which affects the industry affects all of us in the valley. Undertakings like this help keep us prosperous. Here's the butter being fed out to be wrapped and packed. It's all done automatically. More than 1,400 dairies and over 130,000 dairy cattle help make this butter. We're particularly proud of our dairying industry and we wanted to take a good look at it. After all, it's the industry most commonly associated with our valley and the only one spread right over the 10,000 square miles of the Hunter region. To the north of Hexham is Port Stephens, one of the most colourful parts of our valley. Here where the valley meets the sea, at its northern end, is our playground. Two headlands guard the entrance to a waterway bigger than Sydney Harbour. Shoal Bay, just inside the head, has safe sheltered beaches. Opposite, on the northern side, Hawks Nest, the venue for many state fishing championships. Dawn, the boats head for the open sea and some of the best big game fishing grounds in Australia. A strike, no let up now till man or fish is beaten. The victory flag tells the outcome of the fight and the boat returns for the wave. There's Bob Dyer. We know him on radio and television, but we've heard of his fishing victories too. Most big game fishermen come here sooner or later. No wonder with the prospect of a catch like this. But without a fight, the water will yield other good things. Acres of oyster beds fill the quieter parts of Port Stephen. The bush around the bay is one of the reasons for its popularity as a holiday resort. It really is a beautiful place. From the air, some more scenery. Not quite so beautiful, but an unforgettable sight. On the western approaches to Newcastle, the vast, vital mass of the steelworks. This is the sign of Newcastle's prosperity. Steel, the basic raw material of modern industry. The giant steel industry at Newcastle has a capacity of well over one million ingot tons and a product most important today, stainless steel. 
It began when the Broken Hill Proprietary Company, Australia's biggest company, opened its Newcastle Steelworks in 1915. Today, the steel industry is the basis of the economic life of Newcastle. And it's going even further. A vast scheme to reclaim land from the Hunter River will make several thousand acres available for industrial expansion. Steel products for export. Newcastle has helped build Australia's steel exports to a value of over 42 million pounds a year. A proud day at the state dockyards as a new ship is launched into the waters of the Hunter. It's natural that one of Australia's greatest industrial ports should help build the ships to carry the products of our valley to all parts of the world. From the mines of the valley, coal, over four million tons a year. A new coal loader will help to double this figure. At Wanji, near Newcastle, the new thermal power station, feeding electricity into the state system. Power, power for heavy industry. Sulphide Corporation plant, for instance, producing zinc and lead and fertilizers for the farms of the Hunter Valley. Power, power for light industry. Power to make and light the lamps made in this factory, another Newcastle industry. So at last, the Hunter reaches the sea, 200 miles from the mountains where it began. Nobby's signal station stand guard at the mouth at the entrance to Newcastle Harbour. Newcastle is an industrial metropolis, a busy, vigorous, young city going places. But it's a city hand in glove with the country, and somehow when Newcastle goes gay, there's something there that the bigger cities just haven't got. This is one thing the others haven't got. Every year we hold the Matara Festival. Matara? That means the hand of friendship. And that's how we feel about it. goes on for a week and there's a romantic touch. A princess is elected to rule the city. We choose the girl whose hand fits a special glove. The affairs of the city are decided here at City Hall. And here nearby, we have built a cultural centre. Here are the works of Australia's great men of arts and letters. William Dobell, for instance. This man, whose work is internationally acclaimed, has chosen to live at Lake Macquarie in one corner of our valley. William Dobell is an inspiration to other young artists. 
We have many aspiring Dervilles in the valley, and at regular art exhibitions, they have their chance to catch the public eye. In our mild Hunter Valley climate, many art shows are held outdoors. This one is in a park in Newcastle. Our business life depends on our transport system. Streamlined trains run to many parts of the valley and Newcastle and several of the large valley towns have airports. We have television and many radio stations serving the valley. Summer brings many of us to the beaches along the valley's Pacific coastline. The clean sand and the white froth of the surf are irresistible. Several times during the long swimming season, there are surf carnivals on the beaches. The lifesavers who keep the beaches safe show the rescue and resuscitation drill in competition, and you can usually rely on a big surf to liven things up. On the brink, in the drink. Not all our water sports are this rough. In fact, if you like quiet waters, Lake Macquarie is the place. The lake is just south of Newcastle and it's mostly enclosed water, a paradise for the yachtsman. This is Rival, winner of the World Classic Sydney to Hobart Yacht Race. The race is run from Sydney Harbour to the Derwent River in Tasmania every year. The Yawl Ruthian, another champion you'll meet here. And Australia's own BJ, the cheeky little boats of yachting. With all this, it's not surprising that more and more people are visiting our valley. And with motels like this to stay at, a holiday in the Hunter is a real pleasure. No need to introduce this. We like our racing in the valley. There's added pleasure in knowing that many of the horses were bred on studs in the upper Hunter. Sport is pretty important to us. We go in for just about everything, and the playing fields you'll find everywhere in the valley have produced many fine sportsmen. Hunter Valley is a wonderful place. We live in it, we love it, and we're proud of it. We're proud of its rich, fertile soil and the many rewards it gives us. We're proud of its past and confident of its future. The valley must go on growing, must continue to succeed. It is bursting with possibilities. A great valley of 10,000 square miles with a population of almost 350,000 people with rich primary, secondary and tertiary industries earning 200 million pounds a year. Newcastle is Australia's greatest exporting port 
busy with ships carrying our valley's produce to the four corners. Here there is a great harvest to be won in the field and in the factory. And we who live in this valley have a great charge to make the most of what we have been given to build and build. Given life by the river, our soil will grow anything, but we must put in as much as we take out, protect the soil, conserve the water. We have seen the valley and we have met its people. We have followed the Hunter River from the snow and the mountains to the crowded harbour of Newcastle. We have something to learn from the river, from its small beginnings and its great destiny. We have so much youth, vigour and great natural riches. But what of the future? That lies in the hands of our children. They will inherit what the pioneers began and what we have continued. Soon when they become the custodians of the valley, it will be their work to improve it, to make it an even better place to live, a happy and prosperous corner of our country. We know our valley will be in safe hands. Today, our young people are fitting themselves for the work that is ahead of them. They have secure foundations to build upon and a golden promise for the future. The valley has nurtured them. As they go forward, they will always be proud to say, we live in this valley.